Matthew 26, Matthew 26, Matthew 26. And we're going to read verses 44 through 56. 44 through 56. I'm sliding now, sis. I'm trying to see if I got it. Okay. Can y'all can see it on the screen? What about that one? All right. Bless the Lord. All right. Verse number 46. We're going to read to verse 56. If y'all can, can we all stand in unison? Just in unison. For the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 26, verse 46 through 56. Uh, quick context, we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, he's with his disciples. This is going to be a rough night for Jesus. But I promise you, there's something valuable to take away from this night as well. Verse number 46, just for purpose of context. Rise! Let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Verse 47. And while he yet speak, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great multitude with swords and staves or uh, uh, what's that? Clubs. Uh, okay, you gonna do it? You gonna do it, sis? Okay, she got it. Okay, cool. Verse number forty-eight. Now he who betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, "Whoever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him." Right. Verse number forty-nine. Forty-nine. Immediately he came to Jesus and said, "Hail, Rabbi!" and kissed him. Verse number 50 is one of our emphasis. Jesus says to him, friend, why are you here? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Verse 51. And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand, drew his sword, and struck the servant of the high priest and struck off his ear. Verse 52. Jesus says to him, put your sword back in its place. For all those who take the sword will die by the sword. Verse 53, this is crazy. Jesus says, uh, 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 do, do you think I, I couldn't ask my daddy? I, I couldn't ask my father and he would even now send me more than 12 legions of angels? Verse 54, how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? 55, in that hour Jesus says to the crowd, have you come out against the robber with swords and clubs to seize him, seize me? I sat daily in the temple teaching and you didn't arrest me. Verse 56 is our last verse. But all this has happened, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. I want to continue in our series moving forward, and I'm going to speak on the subject, dealing with undefined relationships. Moving forward, dealing with undefined relationships. If I could use the subtopic, uh, putting relationships in the proper context. Putting relationships in the proper context. Um, I don't know what you all personally believe, but I personally believe that the issue for many of us is not the want to in moving forward. I'm sure all of us have the ambition, the desire to move forward from where we are. I believe one of the major plights for many of us is wrestling with, Danny, the ability to or the how-to in moving forward. So briefly, I want to lift up three possibilities of why there's an issue for you and I from moving forward. Number one, one of the issues, possibly, Rodney, of us moving forward is that we deal with the mismanagement of unavoidable life detour signs. Unavoidable life detour signs. Uh, if you drive on a 110, give me some freeways. What do y'all drive on, 110? The five, who drive on a five? Jesus. The 10 freeways? Any 10 freeways? Any one-on-ones? Oh, yeah, yeah, on, on a bad day. Okay, 710. We all drive in a 405, right? Okay. Okay, 710, 405, 105. Pick your freeway. <laughs> all of us can attest that we are no stranger, sis, to detour signs. Keena, we're no stranger to stop signs. We're no stranger to stop ahead. We're no stranger to road ending soon. We're no stranger to freeway entrance and exit closing. And, and Deacon, the issue with that is that many of us interpret stop ahead means stop trying. Let's be honest. Any of y'all ever turned back and went back home because of a stop sign and you didn't want to deal with the responsibility tied to it? Right? I I'm with you. It's frustrating 
having to change directions when I knew exactly where I was supposed to go when I first got on the freeway. But now, Rodney, I'm forced to deal with the frustration when I already had a plan of what to do. For, for some of you who are control freaks, this is one of the worst things. It's to stop when you had a pre-plan beforehand. However, I've learned that the greatest problem is that we neglect to consider every life roadblock or road sign was never designed to stop you. Every life roadblock sign is designed to sway you to consider there's another way to get to my destination. There's another way. The accurate response, Kena, is not there is no way. The accurate response is there must be another way. Pastor DeMarcus, if God puts you on this road, if God is the one who told you to go this way, then he did not cause you to come this way and quit prematurely. And while life scenarios have the appearance of something impossible, you and I cannot afford to forget, according to Matthew 19 and 26, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Number one, Many of us deal with the issue of moving forward. Number two, many of us deal with the issue, or one of the greatest plights of moving forward is dealing with the threat of failure. The threat of failure. Our past, as Pastor DeMarcus shared last week on moving forward from our past, did an amazing job. And uh, I've, I've learned Danny, that one of the issues in dealing with our past is that our past often infects our future because we are forced to deal with the appearance of failure. Not failure itself, Bishop, but the appearance of it. Consider in Scripture, Israel dealing with the Red Sea. They could have quit with the appearance. Israel dealing with the Jericho walls. They could have quit with the appearance. Penina, uh, dealing with her barrenness before she had Samuel, could have quit because of the appearance. And David, Jerry, dealing with Goliath, he could have quit because of the appearance. The list of characters go on. However, we must always take into consideration that the way God looks at a situation is totally different than how we look at a situation. Keisha, while God, while we get distracted by the context of our situations, God finds focus in the context of our situations. I'm excited that Elder, when I look at my situation, God doesn't see it the way I see it. Man doesn't look the way, as God doesn't look at the way you and I see it. Our, our perspective is infected by our emotions. God can look at your situation, have an emotion, and still move forward. Because he has the full context of why you're in the situation that you're in. And I want to take the time to encourage someone this morning. While we may suffer with pain and heartache, while some of you this year, you've been suffering from confusion and chaos, I wonder, can someone take a moment and thank God that he is never distraught by the appearance of your situations? He's never distraught by the appearance. We ought to learn to thank God that God doesn't see it the way we see it. Mom, I've learned to thank God that when I lose hope in myself, God never loses hope. Because he has the full context. I learned that when my grip gets weak, God's grip gets strengthened because he has the full context. I thank God, my brothers and sisters, Keisha, not that I got it all together, but I thank God that when I have proven myself to be faithless, God has proven himself to be faithful. Yeah. Angela, God is faithful. He is dependable. He is a God who is stable. And I got to ask this question. Uh, have you been found guilty? Or let me ask it this way. Do you come to church with a story in your back pocket as to why Jesus is reliable. Do, do we come to church with a story in our back pocket why Jesus is stable? Why he's deserving of your trust? Why he's deserving of your faith? Why he's deserving of your worship? 
Because it's one thing to manipulate people to do what they you do, like karaoke, but people who know God is worthy of it will be able to produce something that's authentic and sincere. My greatest fear for the church is that people are like karaoke, giving you what you gave them, but lack the intimacy context with God. But listen, live with God long enough, and I promise you, you'll find a reason to praise God. You won't have to be forced to the altar, but you'll find a reason to give God the praise. There are times when your altar isn't left at HBC, but there are times when your altar is taken at home. People with mobile altars are people with intimate relationship with God. Bishop has given us an ABC on how to create an altar. But we go home and forgot the instructions on how to build it. When in actuality, if you had a relationship with the Lord, he can give you the context on how to build one with your name on it. Because Bishop can only give you the name of his altar. But you go home, you'll be able to create one with your name on it. So that when you put a sacrifice on your altar, God knows this comes from Michael. This comes from Douglas. This comes from Dee Dee. And the broken experiences of your life is so that God can educate you how to create your own altar. There's a foundational way to build an altar. But for many of us, we lack the context of what that altar looks like. And I'm going to tell you the reason why. is because we have forgotten our why. A why? Because when you have a why, you are convinced moving forward is always possible. Listen, as an act of faith, can someone shout that in this room? Moving forward is always possible. Let's say that one more time. As an act of faith and affirmation, can we declare in this house, moving forward is always possible. One more time with one voice. Someone shout it and believe it. Moving forward is always possible. Moving forward is always possible with someone who has a clearly defined why. You need to know your whys if you expect to be able to effectively handle your what's. Family, without knowing your why, you can be swayed by all kind of what's. But, but when you have a clear understanding of your why, it don't matter what may pop up. In your life. Why? Plight number one, most of us, we deal with the misinterpretation of life detour, detour signs. Number two, some of us are dealing with the plight of the appearance of failure. And for many of us, one of the issues of moving forward is because you need to get reacquainted with your why. Your why? Because your why helps you deal with your what's. I'm telling y'all, I, I come to church with my whys. I, I know what God can do with cancer because of what he did in my mama's life. I, I know what God can do with depression because of what he did in my daddy's life before he passed away. I, I know what God can do with sickness because of what he did in my wife's life. And I know what God can do with sin because of what he did in my life. It is my why that helps me to deal with my what's. It don't matter what may pop up as long as a why sets back in place that God is still worthy of the praise. God is still worthy of the glory. God is still worthy of the honor. And one of the ways you paralyze apathy, lethargic, inconsistency is prioritizing your why. And we find in the text in Matthew 26. That Jesus teaches us that it's one thing to understand your why. It's, it's another thing to deal with your what's. <laughs> but you also need focus and precision on how to deal with your who's. Your who's. Keisha, your who's, your who's, your who's. I feel like the Grinch is old Christmas. The, the who's. The, the who's. The who's in your life, hear me, should never dictate your whys. They should only inspire you that quitting is not an option. And so the reason why this message is so vital and important because we have to embrace 
that the enemy can always dictate the pace of your forward movement if you keep allowing your who's to infect your why's. Are, are y'all with me? All right, to the text. Matthew chapter 26, verse number 36. Jesus and his disciples are found to be in the Garden of Gethsemane. Bible says that they share in the Lord's Supper. They depart from the prepared place to the Mount of Olives, eventually to end up in the Garden of Gethsemane. They end up in the Garden of Gethsemane, but here's something interesting I want you all to take note of in, in, in this particular text. We learn that the Garden of Gethsemane has two Hebrew meanings. Everyone say two. Number one, the Valley of Fatness. That is the place of great fertility. And the second Hebrew meaning of Gethsemane is, I love this, it is called the Garden of the Olive Press. Yeah. It, it, commentary suggests that it's probably because the garden was filled with a lot of olives that were used to make precious oil. Now, if I could be wrong, Bishop, you'll reprimand me a little bit later in regards to the text. Uh, but but, but the, this is, the Mount of Olives is about seven minutes away from Garden of Gethsemane. Now, this is why it's important. It's important because this night, Rodney, is about to be a rough night for Jesus. It's about to be a rough night, Elder. Uh, uh, just like some of you are in a rough season. Be honest. Can anyone be honest with you? I'm in a rough season. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. Uh, you, 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 were, you, were, uh, um, you were believing God to give you a transforming season. However, you, you cannot expect positive without negatives because they both are designed to balance each other. Your card does not start without both positive and negatives. Romans says all things work together for the good to them that love God, those who are called according to his purpose. Jesus had three years of amazing ministry, but this night is about to be a rough night. It's about to be a rough night, family, because he knows he's about to be arrested. He's about to be ridiculed. He's about to be tried. But family, what's interesting to take note of here is that while Jesus is about to engage in the greatest trial of his life, he first is found in the greatest pressing in his life. In the garden, he's being pressed. The Bible teaches that after he has commanded his disciples to wait and pray for him, he isolates himself deeper in the garden. He begins praying with a great sense of grief and anguish for what was waiting for him. But Kenan, this is what's interesting to note, is that while Jesus is in the garden and he is being pressed very aggressively, he is surrounded by a lot of olives. And if you was to press the olives, you could extract the oil that was inside of them. While, while most of us have seen the Garden of Gethsemane as a place of anguish, as a place of grief, we need to learn that this is the place of great extraction. Well, this is the place of great extraction. God was trying to extract his will from his son. That this is the place where God was trying to extract his obedience from his son. This is the place where God is trying to extract greater place, focus from his son. And some of you this day are fighting with moving forward because you are being hard pressed. And God told me to tell you, don't you dare despair. For the place of great pressing, for the place of great anguish, for the place of great grief is actually the place of great extraction. God is squeezing out of you his will. God is squeezing out of you his purpose. God is squeezing out of you his provision. God is squeezing out of you his power. This is not the place of anguish. This is not the place of grief. This is the place where oil is extracted from your life. Can someone give God the praise and shout, God is extracting oil from my life. I can't say, can someone declare in this house, God is extracting oil from my life. He's extracting oil from your life. Bishop, I learned there's a difference between a vanilla extract and imitation vanilla flavoring. Oh, yeah. I learned there's a difference between imitation and extract. While imitation, Dwayne, is cheaper, it cannot compare to extract. Some cakes would not respond to imitation as it would to the extract. And so while it may be cheaper, it will not produce what you are expecting. The extract is authentic. Watch this. The imitation is a carbon copy. God is not extracting to create an imitation. God is not extracting to create a counterfeit. God is not.
not extracting to create an impression. God is extracting to create authenticity. I want to encourage someone in this place that God wants the raw oil from your life. He wants the unfiltered oil, the untainted oil, the undefiled oil, the unaltered oil. God wants the oil he can use to saturate and transform the world you live in. Someone shout, God is extracting oil from my life. You're not in the place of grief, bro. You're not in the place of anguish. You are in the place of great extraction. God is using that oil to saturate your situations. God is using that oil to saturate your conditions. God is using that oil to transform the world you live in. And while most of you want God to kind of play it nice, God says, if I play it nice, the oil will come out in imitation. But the only way I get the raw oil, I got to cause you to go through some great suffering, great trials, great persecution. I want the unaltered oil. I want the unfiltered oil. I want the oil that hasn't been tainted by man. Your situation, your situation is the incubator. That leads to you birthing the raw oil from your life. Oil is being extracted. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's going through a place of great pressing. Uh, he's in a place, y'all still with me? He's in a place of great pressing. He's in a place where God is extracting obedience from his life. And Jesus teaches us uh, that he has a clearly defined why. Jesus is effectively able to manage his what's. And then the Bible teaches that he also knows and teaches us how to deal with our who's. Our who's. Let's, 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 let's deal with this just for a little bit. Verse 41 through 46. Jesus prays to his father. Jesus finds his disciples sleeping three times. Jesus continues to pray. And then uh, after he continues to pray. Oh, thank you, sis. I, I got jacked up. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, 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 he continues to pray. And the Bible says a group of people approached Jesus and disciples while they were there. Key to verse number 47, at inner stage right, Judas Iscariot. Everyone start booing. Everyone start booing. Okay, let's try again. Y'all know when the antagonist comes in the room, y'all know what to do, right? Inner stage right, Judas Iscariot. But Bible says he's seen leading a band of soldiers and agitators, They're carrying clubs and weapons to Jesus. And uh, Jesus comes and he greets Jesus with a kiss. Judas comes and greets Jesus with a kiss. Now, if y'all don't know who Judas is, this won't mean nothing to you. But for those of you who know Judas, you probably start feeling irritated right now because you start thinking that Judas is your life, right? Isn't it interesting that you look at some characters, you start automatically looking, who does that remind me of? Who does that remind me of, right? Somebody already comes to mind. Here's something interesting. So the Bible says in Matthew 10 and 4, Mark 3 and 19, we're told that Judas is one of the chosen by Jesus. However, the red flag about Judas is that while he knows he is one of the followers of Jesus, he's also known to be a betrayer. Right from the jump, he's the one who will betray Jesus. This is, yeah, you feel me, sis? You already know. So here's another thing. The Bible says in John chapter 12, you all remember when Mary comes, uh, she comes and washes Jesus' feet. Uh, with this oil, and she's washing Jesus' feet with her, uh, with her tears, and she's drying it with her hair, and there's a disciple who comes to complain that she is wasting this oil on his dirty feet, and, and he, she he was saying that we could have used the money for this oil for the poor. Come to find out, champ, that this disciple was Judas, and he didn't even care less about the poor. Bible said that he was over the money box, and he wanted the oil's money for himself. Judas, yeah, is one of the followers of Jesus, but he was also a betrayer, and he was also a thief. Somebody say red flag, red flag. Here's the issue. The real issue is Jesus still called him. Now we got to deal with this. Because while you and I would be asking God to get rid of our Judases, Jesus was fully aware of Judas and still called him one of his own. So now we got a dichotomy in us moving forward because we think moving forward hinges 
on separation. God says moving forward doesn't hinge on separation. Moving forward hinges on preparation. Preparation, watch this, and affirmation. Since go to the next, go to the next slide. Next slide, please. Come to the next slide for me. So, so here's the thing. The Bible says that Jesus embraces him and says, friend, why are you here? I got a problem, sis. Jesus is called a betrayer and a thief, a friend. Right? By this point, when I realize who Judas is, Keisha, he ain't no friend no more. If, if I know, bro, you're going to throw me under the bus, you lost that title. You with me, sis? Baby, you with me? Here's the thing. I would call him an associate. <laughs> associate? <laughs> or I would call him a reference. Watch this. Who are associates? Associates are people who have information regarding you, but lack the intimacy to value you. Judas is a follower of Jesus, but the problem is that while he knew information of Jesus, the intimacy he had with Jesus was not enough for him to throw him to the wolves. One of the issues for us moving forward, for somebody in this room, is because you have not effectively, accurately put the people in the right position in your life. Watch this. And you're known to defend someone with ratchet character traits. Some of you cannot move forward because you are more adamant in defending someone with ratchet character traits when God is trying to get you to understand they're poisonous. They're toxic. And you're praying me to send you to a place where they don't want to go. So, so I got to get to this. So watch this though. While all of us see red flag in Judas, Jesus sees in him differently. He sees him differently. Go to the next one, sis. He, he sees him differently. And, and, and here's the thing about Jesus is that while Jesus is dealing with Judas, I'm contemplating, sir. I said, God, my Judases, I don't want them here. They affect how I see. They affect how I hear. They affect what I do. But Jesus tries to teach us how to deal with associates. He's trying to tell us something. When you put them in the proper context, it will free you from their bondage. Moving forward is not from separation. Moving forward is putting an associate in the right context. God is saying is if you gave them the right label, they won't have the power to hold you back from your destiny. The problem with the associates in your life, they are walking around with the wrong label. And Jesus teaches us that when associate has the right label, you'll be free from their bondage. So while all of us are adamant past Akina and saying, Jesus, why don't you get rid of Judas? Because Jesus says, Judas serves a role in my life. Watch this. I already knew he was a betrayer. I already knew he was a thief. I already knew he was a liar. I already knew he was a lover of money. The problem y'all neglect to see is I still needed Judas because he's nothing more than a role player. Friend, why are you here? He didn't change his name. He didn't throw shade on him. He said, I know what role you play. Go to the next one, sis. And, 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 and while he is explaining to the people that they know the role, he's trying to explain to us is that when you put certain associates in the proper context, it will free you from their bondage and will give you the freedom to move forward in your destination. Now, for those of you who are in this room and you're fighting with the Judas and the unforgiveness is still raging on your heart, your mind, and, and you're still fighting with uh, jealousy and issues, and, and just the thought of them is a problem, this is what the Lord gives. Wicked, uh, those with associates with wicked agendas will self-destruct. You don't need to kill them. Just let God deal with how they did you dirty. 
while most of us are walking around with a knife in our back ready to kill Judas, Jesus didn't feel the need to take Judas out. He was already in proper context. And if there's a problem with Judas' character, he'll self-destruct. Just let, let God deal with how they did you dirty. I got to hurry to the next group. Next group. We find in verse number 52. Y'all still with me? I am rolling to the conclusion, Bishop. Verse number 52. Jesus, after addressing his friends, uh, then he starts dealing with the next group. Verse number 51. Suddenly, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and struck off his ear. Then Jesus says to him, put your sword back in its place, for all those who take the sword will die by the sword. Here's verse 53. Here's the point. Or do you think that I could not ask my father, and he would even now send me more than 12 legions of angels? First group we talk about are what I call associates. Second group we find here I call relationals. Everyone say relationals. Relationals are those who are your friends, your spouses, your boyfriends, your girlfriends. Relationals, watch this, they have information of you and they have intimacy with you. You're with me. We value these relational connections because they help us towards our why. However, there's something you need to learn what Jesus teaches us in the text. We find here that when it comes to dealing with the relational, you got that note, sis? You got to be careful because relationals will find themselves out of context and will try to insert themselves in spaces that only God is supposed to fill. While it's healthy to have a demand for relationals, people who have your heart, who have your mind, and have your spirit, you got to be careful in not inserting a relational in a space that only God is supposed to fill. Who is Simon Peter? He walked on water. He was the one on the mountain with the, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus said, on this rock I'll build my church. Peter is a relational, bro. But the problem with Peter is that while Peter is here and he's relating with Jesus, the problem we have is that Peter felt the need to do something Jesus never asked him to do. And so Jesus had to take a step back and say, Peter, stick to your role, bro. That you are a role player. And the only way you're able to move forward with relationals is when you're willing to put them in the proper context. I got to hasten my conclusion. Kina, come here. Kina, you're, you're, you're my associate. Yes, sir. Aaron, very quickly, I'm running out of time. Actually, I'm out of time. Hold this. You're what's called the relationals. You're my good friend. Then we find in verse number 55, one more group. They're called what I call the randoms. Come on, random. random. The randoms. Get there. The randoms. The randoms are, who are randoms? They're they. Others. The other ones, they are there. Randoms. They'll surprise you because randoms are chameleons. They're chameleons. Randoms have the ability to be your friend and enemy at the same time. Randoms are inconsistent in nature. They'll like you one moment, but hate you the next. I, got, I don't have much time. Verse 55. Verse 55. The text says, verse 55. Read this to me real quick, Dwayne. Okay, I'll paraphrase. Jesus basically says, wait a minute, y'all. Y'all coming at me like a robber. You come at me with clubs and weapons, and y'all forgot I've been teaching in the temple every day. Every day. And now y'all want to, y'all didn't arrest me before, and now you want to arrest me? What's the problem? I, I don't understand. How is it that you were there listening, embracing what I had to give you, but now you act like we don't know each other? Next note, sis. Can you go to that next note? Relationals, uh-huh. Randoms. It's easy for them to forget what you did for them because they don't care nor do they know who you are to them. 
it's easy for them to forget what you did for them because they don't care, nor do they remember who you are to them. Jesus was pouring out to the random on a regular basis, but no one took the time to find commitment and consistency because they did not want commitment. Randoms. Randoms. Is there another one? Randoms. Okay, here it is. Here's the main point. Randoms, random people have random emotions, but don't bank on their stability without consistency. Character traits. Here's my last point as I hasten over. He is my references. He is my randoms and my relationals. Open that up for me. The challenge for many of us is this is life. We're surrounded by references. David, we're surrounded by randoms. Come on, bring it around us. And we're surrounded by relationals. Oh, Aaron, hold it, and you go around us. And for many of us, this is your life. And the problem is that you are frustrated from moving forward because you're surrounded by role players without definition. That's it. Come on, Kenny, you're inside. You're good. Just, just yeah. Root around you, bro. Come on, you, you go over here. <laughs> Facebook brings people to suicide because Facebook says you have friends, but they don't have definition. <laughs> Depression from in, and insecurity from Instagram are from those who follow you without definition. People who like and share your tweets are people who you thought know you but lack the intimacy to value you. And you are in this church and the reason why your past has been resurrected is because while God can free you from your past, some random, some relational, or some reference has the power to resurrect it back from you. One picture can resurrect your past. One tweet can resurrect your past. One post can resurrect your past. And while Jesus, uh, while Bishop has been praying for healing from somebody's body, this day God is about to heal somebody's mind because you're about to put people in the proper context. Come here, wife. Y'all walk. Well, life, Bishop, y'all just smashed the mic out of my hand. Out of, listen, well, 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 this has been life. And you had references, relationals, and randoms to follow you. The only way you'll get freed from these people is when you learn to put them in proper context. This is proper context. Proper context is the one who's supposed to be driving this bus. You want text? Verse 56. Jesus, at the end of the day, on a rough night, says, I've got references, I've got relationals, and I've got randoms. But the reason why I'm not messed up with emotional compromise is because I already put them in the proper context. Give her the steering wheel. You get in your place. You too close, you get in your place. Proper context, you steer us. Let's go. In this way, because I put my connections in the proper context, it don't matter what they say because they're serving their role. This had to happen to fulfill prophecy. Keep going. Randoms can talk all they want to talk because they serve their role. Reference kids can talk all day, but they're serving their role. And while some people fall off, some people fall off. I'm not jacked up because his role is over. Some randoms will tag other random to take their place. But if the random is in proper context, I'm still able to move forward. I've got a destination. I've got a why. I don't care about the what. I'm going towards my why. Jesus said, 
this had to happen to fulfill prophecy and I'm free from their bondage because they serve wrong I need a Judas I need a Peter I need the randoms but I need proper context Your freedom hinges on you putting your references, your relationals, and your randoms in proper context. Proper context means defined role players. I already knew he was a betrayer. That doesn't make him less of a friend. He just needs to be put in proper context. Simon Peter, did you forget? I got a daddy who can take care of this situation. That don't make him less of a friend. He just needs proper context. Random people. What is your name, Sway? It don't matter. Because when you put them in proper context, you'll be freed from their bondage. And moving forward, for someone in this room, the, it's not freedom that God wants to give you this morning. It's liberation. Because freedom sometimes go from day to day. But liberation is when God says, I can leave them in their place. And you can still move forward. Because you're prioritizing your why. I want to please the Lord. I want to make him happy. I feel the weight of my re references. Sometimes I close them in so I'm reminded why they're here. Sometimes this is you where God is closing you closer to people that you want God to divorce you from. When God is saying is every connection is tethered to your destiny. Wow, wow. Jesus says, I realize this had to happen to fulfill the words of the prophets. And I want to be, I want to, here's the thing. Jesus, after finishing all this, he goes to the cross. And Bishop, forgive me, please, you can reprimand me afterwards. Bishop, I mean, Jesus goes to the cross of Calvary. He dies for our sins. You know what really gets me? He doesn't throw shade on his relationals. He doesn't talk bad about his references. He doesn't talk bad about his randoms. You want to know why? Because after Jesus finished his why, those who followed him had new defined roles. You don't want to come to a place where you feel the need to divorce yourself from everybody. You ask God, say, Lord, if I'm the sacrifice for my randoms and relationals and references to find new defining roles, let it be. Maturity in moving forward is not you getting rid of them. Maturity is, watch this. Come on. Because of Jesus... You are now new role players. Hallelujah. Come on, random. For when references, relationals, and uh, randoms find definition with Jesus, we all become sons. Watch this. Even though they become a son, they may steal with certain character traits. That doesn't make them less of a son. Yes, sir. You just need to remind them who the son sets free. Yeah. Yeah. A random was a friend out of context. A relational was a friend who lost context. And references sometimes just don't care about the context. But when Jesus is their defining role, it doesn't matter where they've been or what they've done. Because we all now serve the same why. 
It may take time, but we're going to get there by and by. Now I'm believing by faith that God's going to bring us to it. Someone give God praise in this room. Can you stand up on your feet very quickly? Stand up on your feet very quickly.